Good morning. Today we are going to be in the book of Matthew. This is one of those messages that came through a experience that was had shared by my son and I as uh, we prayed for his his papa. His, uh, I don't even know how you explain this one, but his step papa uh, come to know the Lord. So Matthew chapter 20 is where we're going to be camped out today. And we're going to bounce a little bit back and forth, so if you are likely to follow along, the other passage we're going to read from today will also be found in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. When you work at a job, for a set amount of pay, you expect to receive that amount of pay, correct? Yes? You kind of, you, you kind of, you make a deal, you, well, you don't really make a deal, you usually they tell you what you're going to get paid, and, uh, and then you kind of move up from there. It's not usually something you can negotiate, uh, especially um, when, when you're working a, a normal job. Um, it's, you know, that you, but you, you get set to do a certain job and you get, you get paid for that. Now, if someone were to work half the amount of time you did, would you expect them to get paid less? Yes? A what? 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 Let's say out, let's say hourly. So let's say you're getting paid hourly. Would you, because the salary doesn't matter, does it? You're getting paid the same whether you're two hours or 55 hours. Um, but uh, if let's pretend we're working hourly, and somebody works half as much as you did, would you expect them to get paid half as much as you do? Yeah, makes sense, right? Okay, there are some who work in places for a number of years, and they earn what is called seniority, right? You work a certain number of years, and you 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 gain. You gain this seniority, you often get paid more. Sometimes that doesn't always work, and sometimes it gets changed around. I don't know how the regular workforce does things now. I've been out of it for so long. But uh, that's how it was when I was working. Uh, in fact, you would work so many years, or you'd work, I mean, each year you'd get a little bit of a raise, and you'd get bonuses and stuff like that. They expect to be paid more than the greenhorn who started yesterday, correct? Usually, the, the, the new person. But this doesn't seem to always work out the way they we want it. We're going to look at this parable. It's not really a parable. You're really just telling the story. But it is, I would call it a parable of the vineyard. And in the vineyard, we have a master who owns the vineyard. And I'm going to read through this with you right now. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is like this. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, a master of the house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you, go into the vineyard. You go in the vineyard too. And whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said to them, You, go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when, he, when those hired about the eleventh hour, Came, each of them received a denarius. 
And when those hired, and now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, to those who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. And he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now that was a hard one for some of these guys to understand. In the vineyard, the vineyard usually represents either the kingdom of heaven, it often represents Israel, it represents the kingdom or the community of, of God's believers. Grapes in that time were the most important crop of the of ancient Israel. Why do you think? Anybody know? Yeah, the wine. You needed one. Wine was not just a libation. Wine was a very important item to have because it was actually healthier to drink than the water at that time. And but you still had to be careful because it's very easy to overindulge. So they but it was a very important crop. Israel was often referred to as the vine or the vineyard. Here it represents the activity of this world. Now let's look at the master of the house. If Jesus is talking about heaven here, then we know that God the Father is the master of the house, right? God is the master of the house. In, then we know in this parable, the master of the house makes an agreement with those he hires first thing in the morning to pay them a denarius. What he pays anyone else, it is his money, right? It doesn't, he has the right, he's the one paying people to do work for him. And the people who came first thing in the morning worked all day, the agreement was what? A denarius. No matter if somebody shows up later or not, that was the agreement. Right? They agreed on that. So, what he decides to do with his money is up to him. So let's look at verses 1 and 2 again. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Okay? So, this is what brings me to the thought of early morning believers. Early morning believers. Now, these are the believers who have started following Jesus at a very young age. They grow up in the church. If you break it up in the form of this parable, they are sold out for Jesus from the early morning through to the end. Am I making sense? You understand it? So our early morning believer in this parable, according to this parable, are the ones who give their life to Jesus when they're young, they're kids, and they follow Jesus their whole life. Now that doesn't mean they were perfect. But it means they're sold out to Jesus, and when they mess up, they, they bring their sins to Jesus, they repent, they confess, they work through. No matter what, they're, they're believers. They're following Jesus to the end. And so, according to this parable, it would be to the end of the day, right? So the day 
is going to be our lifetime. Okay? And just for the sake of the parable's sake. Okay? So from start to finish, an early morning believer is someone who believes from a young part of their life all the way to the end. They may go through some tough, scorching challenges throughout their life, but they remain faithful through their lives. Some of the challenges they face sometimes can be jealousy of new believers. That doesn't always happen, <clears throat> but there is that possibility. Sometimes our own religious pride can get in the way of us helping new believers. Think about that. How often do we judge people based on their lifestyle, what they're doing, and how sinful they are, we need to reach out to them and bring the truth. We need to bring Jesus to them. There may be even a bit of jealousy toward new believers, but when they are truly focused on seeing people receive salvation, that will not be an issue. Because our, our biggest thing is we're trying to understand salvation. Being, we hear this word thrown around church all the time, being saved, or getting saved, or letting Jesus into your heart. You hear me say stuff like that all the time. And that simply means you have committed to follow Jesus with your life. And if you're the early morning believer, you did that at a very young age. That's all that means. Okay? Let's look at Matthew 20, verses 3 and 4. Pick up. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, Go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Oh, wait, I'll, I'll pause there. So, so he goes out about the third hour and says, Finds people in the marketplace and brings them in and gets them working. So, the third to sixth hour believers, and I'm just kind of making some of these scenarios up as I go, because I mean, it's not exactly like that, but I'm just trying to relate it to the parable. So these are people who become believers anywhere from the teen years on into middle age. We won't even say what middle age is. They may not have grown up in the church. They may have been exposed to Jesus at youth groups, kids club, or even church camp. <clears throat> but it may not have been a real priority in their life until they were a little older and were able to start wrapping their minds around the whole concept of who Jesus is. Some say that most adult believers accept Jesus by the age of 18. Some say that. That's, those are statistics. I have read, though, that in several different statistics that this is the case. Now, that's not always true. And I know a lot of people who have come to faith long after 18 and have been strong believers from that whole time. These are the people, though, who usually start following Jesus at a slightly older age, older than elementary age. A lot of times, they will say that many people's faith will make it or break it in their 20s. That's been, that's been another statistic that we brought up, is a lot of times, if you don't get them by their 20s, you'll lose them. And they're harder, it's harder and harder and harder to get people to come to follow Jesus. And I mean a committed believer in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we're just going to church and sitting in the pew. That means you are committing your life the following Christ on a regular basis, on a daily, moment by moment. Remember, it was a couple weeks ago, I think I was saying, I need thee every second. Kind of believer. Because we all need him. We need him. We need him every moment. Now, in my own experience, though, I have found that I've met a lot of people who have come to faith well after the and that is, that, that beats the odds. 
that beats any statistics. I mean, statistics, you can use them, you can throw them out the window. They are statistics. That doesn't, that's not everybody's story. In fact, God has a way of taking statistics and throwing them all out the window and making a way for people. If there's a way, if there's a desire in somebody's heart to want to know Jesus, to want to follow him, to want to let Jesus take their life and forever, and they choose, it's a choice you make to follow him. So these are the third to sixth hour believers. Now in my short five years as a pastor here, I have seen some come to faith a lot of times in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it doesn't matter. Salvation is there for every one of us. Now I will say it is harder, especially when logic works against you. But that is the beauty of the awesome power of God because He can call anyone. He can call anyone. Now let's look at verses 6 and 7. And about the 11th hour, well, let's read 5. I missed 5, sorry. So they went, going out again about the 6th hour and the ninth hour, and did the same. And about the 11th hour he went out and found others standing and said, Why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go in the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. I'm going to pause there. So now we have our ninth to eleventh hour believers. Okay? These are the believers who have come to faith late in life. They have seen the world. They have lived for the world. They have lived for themselves. They have seen all that Solomon once wrote to be meaningless and vanity. Let's jump over to Ecclesiastes for just a minute. I'm going to read the first 11 verses to you, so stay with me. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, king of Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities. Now, think about this in terms of somebody who is coming to faith in Jesus later in life. They have not lived for Christ. They have not had the, the, they, they have not had that experience of growing up in church or growing up in faith. Okay? Now, it, Solomon, who wrote this, followed God. But he had a lot of stuff that he chased after that wasn't of God. So he says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and in the circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing it, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which he, which is, is said? See? This is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things. Yet to be among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek 
and search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is, a, it is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity of striving after the wind. I know I went past verse 11. But here are some reflections of a king who had everything. Solomon had everything you can imagine. He built the kingdom that David envisioned. He made it happen. He had well over 700 plus wives. He had riches beyond belief. And he yet was known as the most wise man. Or was it the second wisest? I can't remember. But he, well, the thing that he asked of God more than anything was to have wisdom. And I think what Solomon learned is that with wisdom comes a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And when you're striving after the things of this world, it's all vanity. It's a chasing after the wind. Have you ever seen somebody chase after the wind? Have you ever chased after the wind? Do you know what the wind looks like? You can't see behind those there. You can feel it. You just know it's there. Same thing with God, right? You see the effects of the wind. I can't see the wind, but I can see the effects of the wind. Have you ever seen somebody chase the wind? Well, sailboats, they're a great example, but a person, I mean, if I'm trying to chase the wind, I can't, I can't catch it. And I look kind of silly, don't I? Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to catch this wind that the, that the fan's blowing. I can see this fan going around in circles, but I can't see the air. That is, I can feel the air though, right about here. So I should move the pulpit back about this far, <laughs> and I would be sitting in my zone. That's the point that Solomon's trying to make. You can, you can chase after stuff. We can have all the stuff in the world, you know. My struggle with Christmas is we just keep collecting more stuff. I'm like, we need to get rid of at least three, four bags of stuff just to bring in the new stuff. I'm like, is this really what Christmas is about? No! Yeah, we keep doing it. It's a chasing after the wind. And so Solomon is recognizing this, he's seeing this, and he's saying, Chasing after this stuff is like someone who's chasing after the wind. He bemoans the fact that life without God is all meaningless and vanity. When we're chasing after stuff, who are we satisfying? Ourselves. And when we're focused on ourselves, are we really focused on God? Are we focused on our relationship with Jesus? But if we focus on Jesus, our whole, our whole perspective starts to change. Without Jesus in our lives, is there anything, is there any real eternal purpose? And we might have like, you know, purposes in life, my purpose is to have fun. My purpose is to sail that boat. My purpose is to ride that motorcycle. My purpose is to get that big buck, which I saw a child this weekend. Not mine. Friends of ours went hunting this weekend. This was a 13-year-old girl. Got a 15-point buck. I said, how does that happen? I, you know, now, not that I'm a real hunter. I mean, I've never even seen it. Like, I'm sitting there counting all the pawns on this, but blew me away. But if that's our only purpose, guess what? That purpose gets eaten up in about a year. And if you keep the rack, which I hope they do, um, 
What happens to the raft eventually if you don't take care of it? It collects dust, right? It's the same thing. I I, I used to have all my 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 uh, metals and stuff hanging up all the time, and all they do is collect dust. My wife would say, well, "What about your swords? Your swords? All they do is collect dust." Well, yeah, but they look cool. <laughs> but again, it's just stuff. It fades away. If that's our purpose in life, then our purpose is limited. But if serving Jesus and following Jesus is our purpose, that brings eternity into life. See, we have this void inside us, and this is what Solomon was recognizing. There's this void that he kept trying to fill. Instead of filling it with God, instead of us trying to fill it with Jesus, we fill it with stuff. Sometimes it becomes drugs or alcohol or sex or entertainment or adrenaline rushes or how much stuff you can collect. What happens? But you're still looking for more. And so we try to fill that void, but the only thing or the only one that can fill this void is Jesus. That is exactly what our 11th hour believers come to realize. C.S. Lewis, he has become one of my heroes of faith, of um, my favorite, one of my favorite writers, and probably not my favorite writer. He said this, and he wrote this in his own autobiography called Surprised by Joy, The Shape of My Early Life. He writes this, you must picture me alone in that room at Maudlin, and Maudlin is a college, Maudlin College is part of Oxford University. So picture me in that room in Maudlin, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted, even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him, whom I so earnestly desired not to meet, now, I'm going to pause there. C.S. Lewis didn't want anything to do with God. He wanted nothing to do with God. And he's, so he's sitting there, every time he lifted his mind off at his work, there was this unrelenting approach of him, whom I so earnestly desired not to meet, that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave it and admitted that God was God. And I knelt and prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing the divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet. But who can duly adore that love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance of escape the words compel. Now, I'm, I'm going to read. I know there's some who, who actually speak Latin, so correct me on my pronunciation. Com, compelle entrare. Entrare. In, how is it? Thank you. <laughs> compelle entrare. I can't even do it. That just sounds awful. So you sound, say it one more time. So it's very good. All right, you speak very much better Latin than I do. Anyway, I had to actually look that up, and it literally means to compel people to come in. Um, but he, so to compel them to come in, they have been so abused be, by wicked men that we shudder at them. But properly understood, they plumb the depth of the divine mercy. 
The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. So C.S. Lewis literally said, I came to know Jesus kicking and screaming and fighting and, and literally dragged me in to this relation. He wanted nothing to do with it. Because in his mind, from a little boy on, he felt God had let him down because he prayed that God would save his mom from cancer and she died. And at that moment, C.S. Lewis, as a small child, decided, I'm done with God. He no longer exists in my life, and I'm not going to believe in him. In fact, he was mad at God for not existing. And he tried his very best to ignore the fact that God exists. And here he comes in this moment. The most reluctant convert in all of England. What an amazing story that is. And yet God still welcomed us out with wide open arms. Another hard pressed convert was the Apostle Paul. We really hated Christians, hated people. Who believed in Jesus, and we have read and studied much of his life. His most life-changing moment was on the road to Damascus, and it literally took a visit from Jesus himself to change Paul's heart. In fact, he was blinded three days by the experience. Then his story took a major turn for him to proclaim the gospel for the rest of his life. That's like the equivalent of taking a guy like Osama bin Laden. Imagine that for a moment. Osama bin Laden. Right. If Jesus had come down on the road and said, I want you to preach the gospel. That would be a hard one for all of us to swallow, now wouldn't it? Okay? That's the same thing as what Paul went through. Kind of the same thing what C.S. Lewis went through. Thankfully, C.S. Lewis wasn't anything like Paul or Osama bin Laden, but it's that, it's that equivalent. God can take anybody and turn their heart around. So, that brings us back to our parable. And that read through the Okay, the guys who got started in the morning, they were grumbling because the guy who just started at the end of the day got paid the same as they did. I pray we don't do that with our salvation. Those of us who have been believers, who are really, truly following Christ, they just simply want to see more people come to Christ and be able to experience what we experience. That should be the desire of our hearts. That's why God says, so, and that's why we, we, we adopted these, these verses for our vision, is to love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, go and make disciples of all nations. <laughs> love God, love others, make disciples, because we don't want to see anybody miss out on what comes after. And that's what brought this whole message on was the other night we got a phone call from Caden's grandmother, his biological grandmother. And her husband is dying. Now he's cognitive enough to be able to hear and understand everything we're saying, but he is he he's not long for this world. And she said, now he's not a believer in the afterlife. He's not a, he's never believed in Jesus or followed Jesus. I says, well, what do you want me to do? I mean, like, you know, because I want to know, like, what, 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 if he's not going to believe this, then what, what, you know, I mean, I can come and pray for him, but what is his, what is the purpose of him wanting me to come? If he doesn't believe in this, he says, well, I want him. 
by Wasoda Week. Because Cain has been praying for his papa for a long, long time. He prays for him every day that he will come and accept Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. When we went in there, I could see a restless spirit over him. I can see that same void that we try to fill with many other things. I then took him through that prayer. Now, I took him step by step. And I, says, I said to him, I said, you know why we're here? He's like, yeah. I said, now I know you don't believe in the afterlife. This is a moment, okay, where I'm done worried about if I offend you with the gospel. If you're offended by the gospel, sorry, this is the gospel. If you die without Jesus in your heart, you're, you're, you're going to suffer eternal suffering, separated from God. And I, I don't care if that offends you. Okay? I don't care if that hurts your feelings. Because I love you so much that I don't want to see you. I don't want to miss out on you when I go to heaven. And that is exactly how Katie felt for his grandfather. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have hope. You don't have hope without Jesus. Sorry I'm getting so emotional, but no I'm not. I'm not sorry for this. Because if you don't have him, you're, you don't have anything after this. And I'm just blowing smoke in your ear. And I'm done being afraid of hurting your feelings over it. You need Jesus Christ in your life. And he loves you so much that he wants you to hear this message. And if you're watching on Facebook, he wants you to hear it now. And so I took him through the prayer. And I don't think prayers save you. It's what you let your heart, because you can pray the prayer with me all day. And if you just word them, you just say the words with me, you're just repeating my words. You have to let it get into your heart. I don't care who's offended you. I don't care who's hurt you. Jesus Christ loves you, wants you, and he wants to welcome you home. And you know what? If I've hurt your feelings, I'm sure I've hurt people's feelings before. We're human. We mess up. But Jesus don't. He's saying, come on home. I'm not, I'm not worried about if this word offends you. <laughs> Jesus loves you so much. And I took him through that prayer. And I invited him in. Or he invited, I'm sorry. He invited Christ into his heart in that moment. As he prayed. And you see this peace just come over him. And these tears just streaming down his face. I can't think of a cooler experience than have my son be able to experience that for his grandfather. And if you're here right now and you're wrestling with this, man, I can't, I can't, I can't say it any more blunt. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ, quit waiting. Okay, and this comes down to the, the, the thought. If you're sitting in a house fire, do you just sit there and go, oh, well, if you want to come out where it's safe, I don't want to offend you, but you're, you know, you might get burned. I don't want, but I don't want to offend you. So, but it's nice out here. If you want to come and join us, and let's let's have coffee together. No, you say get out of that house. It's on fire. Sorry if I'm hurting your ears, because I know I got people with hearing ears. That's the only reason I'm apologizing. But, but you need him. You need him. I need him. And we 
came to that real, I came to that realization years ago. Granted, I'm not perfect and I've not done it perfect. But Jesus loves you so much. Don't wait. Don't let some stupid church thing get in the way of you accepting Jesus Christ and following him. We're church people. We're human beings. We do stupid things. And we offend people sometimes. And we let traditions get in the way. Don't throw that out. Come on. And let him in. Let him in because he's the only one who will never fail. Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's a promise from God that will never change. I don't even know where to go from there. Except to say that if this message, if, if, if the message that God brings here, because the, the whole point, uh, uh, give me a little The point is, it doesn't matter if you gave your life to Jesus when you were five, when you were 25, 45, or if you're 95. Salvation is there for every single human being alive, but you are the one that has to choose it. It's on you. You're not hurting my feelings if you decide to lie to me. If you didn't word it, or if you get, you know, go get baptized and it didn't really mean anything, you just got wet. But if it's really changed your heart and you really want Jesus to transform your life, He will transform you in ways that I could never even begin to preach. It's that love. That comes from him. And that's what that's the whole point of Jesus' parable. Is I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give salvation to every single person who, who comes to faith. Trust him. Trust him. Don't take my word for it. Look at the scripture. And it talks about it from start to finish. God loves you so much. And when you let him in, he is going to transform you from the inside. And I'm so glad that we're all here together to worship him like this. He loves you. Don't hold back. If this, if this is something, if this message has hit you and you feel like, if you haven't made that commitment yet, I invite you to come up. I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you right on the spot. I know we've got people who want to pray with you. They'll do it. I don't even have to ask them. They'll, they'll come up and pray with you. Because the Spirit moves in their hearts to do so. They'll do it. You need to rededicate your life. Come on up and do it. Let him in. He's not going to force you. He's not going to force you to accept him. He never does. But here's him. This is, this is your invitation. And if you decide we're getting halfway through the closing song and you decide you want to do that, I am going to call a few people up, though, and they don't have a choice because they have made a commitment to do this, and this is a very special day. Oh, I forgot. Can we get, for those who really would like it, can we get a couple hand sanitizers up here uh, for people? Because we're going to, um, I didn't think about that before I did this. Um, and I'll just move the chair over here for one side. And... Uh, um, we have, we have some people who have gone through the membership class. They have committed to, to being a part of our church family. And we are so excited to have you here. So I'm inviting our new members to come up, please. Come on. <laughs> 
And uh, we're going to have our, uh, just set one on the chair there, and then uh, I'll grab this one. And uh, so, set it right there. And uh, now, if you have already talked to me about becoming a member and we haven't done the class yet, please come see me again. I will, I will get more applications and uh, constitutions ready. But the tradition that we have in this church is uh, to uh, welcome people in and we do our hand of fellowship. The right hand of Sorry, I obviously haven't done this very often. And so um, we get a preview of uh, our uh, friend John's here, recovery here. He, uh, thank you for playing earlier, by the way. Um, are you able to play through this? Okay, all right, cool. Um, so as John is playing through um, whatever he picks out, and uh, um, I invite you, church family, to welcome our new members. We have Cassandra and Gretchen Kuzman here, mother and daughter. They have they they met with me and went through the class and uh, made the commitment that they want to be a part of our church family. Uh, Mike, who swore all up and down one side and the other that he's been a member his whole life, but I said, I, I, no, not yet, buddy. You still got to do what I had. To, I had to do it too. So he went through and bore with me and took took all the guff that I've given him. And he just said he wanted to make that official today. Well, he, made, he wanted to be official a long time ago. Um, and uh, went through the class with me, and we, you know, we've been praying about it. And so uh, we've got Mike up here, Mike Savola, and we're going to welcome him as well. And then we've got Marty and Carrie Kelly over here, who they went through the class a long time ago, um, along with uh, along with the Kuzmans. And uh, they, uh, they've they been a part of our church now for well over a year, and it's been such a blessing to be with each of you, to be able to talk with you, to pray with you, um, and uh, so we're going to extend the right hand of fellowship, so if we want, let's start the line right over here. That means you all got to get up, and we're going to form a line around here. You need hand sanitizer. Sanitized, and you can re-sanitize on the way out. I'll hold the other one for you. <laughs> 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 